year de puhi kol yamei chayai v'shavti v'veit Adonai l'orek yamin. Surely, surely, goodness or what is good and the translations came to do mercy or the word is that's there uh, is more often translated as kindness uh, surely good things and kindness will follow me all of the days of my life and the word i want to look at with you in, in this particular instance is the word for follow um, again, that's a little too, that's a little too soft. Um, you know, follow can mean all kinds of things. Um, the Hebrew word here would better be translated as pursue. Run down. These things... The shepherd is going to pursue you, not just follow. I can, I can, I can follow from a great, 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 great distance, just so, so that I can just you know, keep watch from afar. But to say that I pursue means that I am determined to get to you and embrace you. That's what the shepherd does. And just follow. Shepherds don't just follow their flocks, they pursue them. And if they get a little bit out of hand, they, they run them down. And that, that's, that really is what the Hebrew word uh, uh, conveys here. Surely that which is good and, and kindness will pursue me all the days of my life. And finally, and all the translations do this. They say, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever or my whole life long. The NRSV does it. The only thing is, the word here that gets translated dwell does not mean dwell. There is an entirely different Hebrew word, verb, for dwell. This word means to return. Now hear it, hear it this way. And I will return into the house of the Lord for length of days. Why don't we have the confession of forgiveness every Sunday? I thought once we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, everything was good to go. Any of y'all seek to see a chiropractor? Ever? I used not to believe in them until I had a back issue and got so <laughs> bad I was willing to try anything. Yeah. And I finally saw one that my one of my cousins recommended. And as he promised, he got me back to 100% with no surgery. Um, but my point is, uh, he, he taught me something in my diagnosis and also about life and faith, you might say. He said, now, you know, you hurt, you, you, you injured your back. But he said, there was more to it than just that moment of the injury. There was bad, whatever improper lifting, bad posture, whatever, that made you led up to your vulnerability to that kind of breaking point. And he said, that being the case, what that means is you can't come in here to me or anybody else or even somebody with a knife and in one moment, you're, you're, all, you're all better. He said, it's gonna take us time to adjust and readjust and readjust, but he said, you, right now you're so bad off and don't realize it, and we're gonna adjust you this time, but as soon as you leave here, guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna start drifting back to the way you've been for a while, outside those ruts that you were supposed to be in. 
and you're going to have to come back, and we're going to have to readjust it again. And then you're going to start, and we'll readjust, and we'll keep, we'll keep readjusting and readjusting and pushing back against that, that we'll finally get you back into a good, a good way. And it took a while, but we did. We did. Um, and likewise, my point is, we come to the altar, we have confession and forgiveness, we receive Holy Communion, we have our sins completely absolved and forgiven, but do we still go astray? Do we still veer off the path of the, the trenches? Do we still sin? Well, yes we do, because all is not yet as it should be. We included in that. And so we must what? return we return and we return um, think about the stories of Genesis how often we have Abraham and Sarah or Jacob or others for various reasons go away go somewhere for, for a time and return the Hebrew people themselves the descendants of Abraham and Sarah winding up in Egypt for a time but eventually very eventually being brought back, returning to, and being finally given the promised land. Um, I think that's what this psalm is saying here. It's not just about some final destination. It's about the journey. And along that journey, the shepherd with the staff bringing us back and us wandering off again. And being brought back again and again and again. Now, that means, what that implies is that, yes, we will, because of that, because of God's faithfulness, which this psalm and the other psalms witness to, yes, we will be returned enough times that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, yes. But before that, there's an awful lot of returning that takes place. And what we miss out on if we miss that about this psalm or about our life of faith, if it's all about getting into heaven, gosh, how much we miss out on here and now that God gives us here and now. This isn't all about getting into some pearly gate. This is about what God has done and given and still offers and makes new for us every single day. It's about this returning and the valleys that crop up that we have to have a faithful shepherd to go through with us. That's what this psalm's about. Which means it is very appropriate to use at the time of death. But for heaven's sakes, try it on for size at some points in life besides that. And hear how powerfully it can speak. Just to have a, a few things to show you tonight, I've got just a few pictures here. Um, it may be, we, we, we really don't know, um, but it may be, whoops, it's not supposed to be that small. That the the well, it's gonna be grainy. That's all right. Okay. That the metaphorical valley this psalmist may have imagined in writing this may have may have been this one. It's called the Wadi Kelt, Q E L T, and uh, it's actually a long valley that stretches all the way from Jerusalem all the way to Jericho. And it is, it is deep. I mean, it's treacherously, dangerously, deadly deep. Uh, down in this valley, there's actually uh, a monastery. The monastery of St. George right there that I've taken groups to a few times. And also along this valley is, as you can see here, there's actually a path. It's a road. It's the road to Jericho. And just to give you a little perspective, this is just the beginning of it. Uh, you can see here some folks walking along this, this and that's why, you see why I said, quote, road. <laughs> and 
And uh, way down here, just to give you some perspective of the people, and then down here, and this is by no means the deepest point of this thing. Uh, way off down here, this thing, it just, it literally, you're literally hanging off the side of the cliff as you walk along. That may, and this, this may be, if not the valley, a valley in vision that you see up here, and way down here. That's the only ones I had to show you. But I, one of the reasons I wanted to show you this as well in, in relation to this psalm and, and deep, dark valleys that sometimes draw us into them. Um, hmm, Terrible Good Samaritan that we just very recently had. Um, this is the very road to Jericho Jesus was talking about. And with that in mind, remember with me a part of that parable. The priest... The others who, who chose not to help the, the poor guy who was beaten up. What, is, what did Jesus say they did? They passed by. On the other side. <laughs> <laughs> One other side. And people that would have heard Jesus would have known this road and said they would have fell on the floor laughing. What other side are you talking about? And that was part of the poke that Jesus was making at the folks who chose not to help the poor injured fellow, they went to a lot more trouble and put themselves in a lot greater danger trying to go around and not touch him than they would have just helping the guy. That was part of his, his dig in the ones who chose not to help. To say that they passed by on the other side, which sounded totally ridiculous to those who heard it. But it's, it is a road where robbers could lay in wait, as you see up here. It has, it, it makes some curves like this, and it makes some curves around the other way where you can't see what's around until you get around there, and if somebody's waiting for you, then you, you, you're pretty much a sick duck. Um, and so, it, you know, it certainly works for that parable that Jesus told, and it also is fitting for thinking of uh, the dangers of a valley as we, as we journey along our way that there is... There are deep, dark, treacherous valleys that are, are, are a threat to us as we, as we seek to stay on the path that uh, the shepherd is leading us along. So I just wanted to share that with you for a little, a little vis visible imagery to go with, not just Psalm 23, but also next time now uh, you hear the parable of the Good Samaritan. We just heard that. I mean, just, of course, we just we don't get that until you're here or if you see that this is the road we're talking about. There is no other side. <laughs> Final questions, comments? I think you cleared up the, the phrase, I shall not want for me. Okay, good. You good. know, you always... I don't yeah, know, I, it's, I can say it's one of those... King, King Jamesy English phrases that's just hung on, and it, that's fine, but it just, you know, and that's, that's the challenge of translation. Um, the, the Jewish rabbis are known to have said and still say, get this, the one who translates loosely lies. But the one who translates literally blasphemes. <laughs> so it's like, well, it, and it's always like this path. It's always a matter of, okay, in the, in the current lingo, language, culture, imagery, song, art of our community, how can I, what would best convey the meaning of the original text into that particular context. And that changes over time. Uh, what conveys that word or phrase to you know, English speakers 500 years ago probably ain't going to do it quite as well today. And so it's a, 